And welcome back to the Tom Hartman University Book Club. We're reading today from Last Hours of Humanity, Warming the World to Extinction. We fight wars all over. This is from the, from the last chapter, chapter 6, uh, titled Staving Off Extinction. We fight wars all over the world for oil, and we don't even need it. That in and of itself is insane. But when you look at a 250 million year old piece of sedimentary rock and see that it's a virtually barren of fossilized life forms, you realize that this is a hell of a lot more important than whether or not our country is going to fight stupid wars in far off lands so the oil companies and the Koch brothers can continue to get rich. This is about the survival of life on this planet, at least as we know it. To hold back extinction, the human race must immediately limit carbon emissions. There are a number of ways to do this. To start with, governments around the world can simply set a limit on carbon emissions and begin fining businesses that pollute beyond that cap. If we want to make it more politically palatable and throw in some profit for the banksters who own so many of our politicians, we could also let businesses and banks set up an exchange and trade carbon credits. Businesses can buy the right to pollute or sell the consequences of their good behavior. In that way, the banksters get to skim a piece off the top, just like they've managed to do with pretty much everything else. This is our best chance to stave off extinction. However, it's politically impossible, at least for now. Although as the consequences of global warming further manifest themselves, political will for a hard cap will undoubtedly build, just like it did with sulfur dioxide that caused acid rain back in the 1980s. It's rarely discussed in the press, but President George Herbert Walker Bush successfully pushed through a cap and trade program for sulfur dioxide, which radically curbed acid rain. It's to buy humanity time in the short term, we may have to settle for a more modest proposal, such as a carbon tax. The concept is simple. Put a price on pollution. Under a carbon tax system, a business would pay, for example, $20 for every metric ton of carbon that they spew into the air. As of 2013, 33 countries and 18 smaller jurisdictions around the world have already put some sort of a price on carbon. In February of 2013, China, the world's largest polluter of car- uh, carbon, announced plans to implement a carbon tax themselves. And the European Union runs a carbon cap-and-trade system. In 2010, Congress nearly passed a comprehensive cap-and-trade law that would have kept carbon emissions at a rational level and required businesses that wanted to pollute beyond the limits to buy carbon credits on the market from other businesses that were polluting below the level. Though that measure died by a Republican filibuster in the Senate, elsewhere around the world, carbon taxes are flourishing. Alongside the EU's cap-and-trade system, several other European nations are also taxing carbon. They include the nations of Scandinavia, the UK, the Netherlands, Switzerland, and Ireland. Other like-minded countries include Costa Rica, which funnels tax revenues from carbon polluters to indigenous communities to help fight deforestation. South Africa, where new auto sales include a carbon tax, and full-scale carbon tax across most other industries have already been implemented. And India, which has a carbon tax of 50 rupees per ton, on coal produced or imported into India. South Korea and Japan have also passed carbon tax measures. Several provinces in Canada have carbon taxes. And here in the United States, there are local camp carbon taxes in San Francisco, Boulder, and Montgomery County, Maryland. While quietly, business leaders and even Republican lawmakers are coming around to the idea of extending a nationwide carbon tax. For a moment, consider exactly what big oil is doing to our planet and how much money they are making in the process. The five biggest oil companies in the world, ExxonMobil, Chevron, Royal Dutch Shell, BP, and ConocoPhillips, dump roughly a billion pounds of carbon into our air every single day. A modest carbon tax that would cut their daily profits by about $10 million and still total for them a staggering $332 million in profits every day is something they can afford as one part of a comprehensive energy policy. It's the bare minimum that carbon polluters should be paying, considering the damages they're inflicting on our planet. Pollution costs, like global warming, are called externalities. These externalities also include the medical costs of increased asthma and cancer care associated with a billion pounds of pollution being burned into the air above our communities every single day. They include the costs of ecological devastation caused when oil rigs explode in the Gulf of Mexico or tankers run aground and spill open off the coast of Alaska. They also include the military costs of deploying armies around the world to ensure that the oil spigots in hostile regions keep flowing and the shipping lanes remain open. And they include the costs associated with climate change, costlier storms, rising sea levels, flooding, and agricultural devastation. Carbon polluters themselves pay for few, if any, of these externalities, but instead they try to pass the bill along to all of us affected by their pollution. That needs to change to prevent disaster. 
when the day comes that businesses know pollution is at their expense, <laughs> they will begin to reduce their carbon emissions. Carbon, uh, capping carbon levels alone won't work. Research out of the MIT Global Change Institute assumed a $20 tax per ton of carbon pollution, increasing 4% every year, and found that it would only modestly curb emissions. This carbon tax scenario falls well short of even the White House's goal of cutting carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. And it would come nowhere close to staving off the projected temperature increases that could make our, take our planet over the extinction tipping point. So a carbon tax needs to be a part of a broader plan that not only eliminates incentives for the use of carbon-based fuels, but altogether phases them out and replaces them with new, cleaner energy alternatives. This will require massive government investment in research and development. It's basically calling for a new Manhattan Project. The book is The Last Hours of Humanity, Warming the World to Extinction by Tom Hartman.